There. So, um, just a couple of words at the start. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing for the last, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years. Rhizomatic learning generally should be thought of as a set of tools to take a look at the work we do rather than something that is whole and coherent. So if you see 20 or 30 percent of this stuff that helps you look at your work, then I'm happy. I should also say, as Pierre Dillenburg has said in my presentations before, that this approach is certainly not something that I would expect that would apply to all situations, but uh, I hope it's still a good ride anyway. All right, so I'm from Prince Edward Island, that little tiny dot over there. Um, about two months ago, it looked like this. That is not a joke. That is a 17-foot snowbank. But in the summertime, it looks like this, and it's very pretty. Um, we are a tiny, tiny little island. One of the things about this whole experience is that somebody who lives on an island of 143,000 people gets a chance to communicate with the world, and there's something really beautiful about that. I work at the University of Prince Edward Island. I use this picture from 1913 because that little maple tree that you see out front is now 100 years old and you can't see my office in any other picture. But I work there. <laughs> see him? He's right there on the right. He's, there were no leaves on that tree when I left home three days ago. I'm just saying, it's cold there. Now, that, in that office, I am uh, responsible for student engagement for retention and for student strategy. So I have a real job, I guess you'd say. And I work on the administrative end of the house, but I'm also an educator. And I'm sort of wandering around the internet and have been for 11, 12, 13 years, trying to figure out what exactly you can do with it. So if I was gonna describe myself as anything, I would describe myself as a teacher. This is the letter H. It's the first thing I ever taught. In South Korea in 1998, I walked into a classroom. I walked in, I was teaching five-year-olds. I walked in the door and little Hugh had a chair over his head, just about to whack the kid next to him over the head. Ever taught five-year-olds, anybody? It's terrifying. So I sat there and I got them to open their books, their textbooks, because I had no idea what we were learning that day. I'd never been in a classroom before and I wasn't trained as a teacher. So they opened their books to the letter H. And I looked at the letter H and I thought, H, I must know words that start with H. So I thought, helicopter, nope. Heliotrope, nope. Helicarnassus, nope. Hat, never thought of hat. Never thought of house. But I did try to draw a helicopter. And in that moment, I asked myself, what exactly am I supposed to be doing here? And why is this textbook telling me what to do? And what is this, like, what is it that I don't understand? And I came to the education field weirdly, like a lot of people actually. I just started teaching. All my formal education and learning happened afterwards. But I always had this weird question. What exactly are we supposed to be doing? And why are we teaching the things that we're doing? And what is it that I'm missing? about this process. Now, I was lucky enough in 2005 to run into a community of people and actually help form that community of people who met every week online to talk about education and technology. Has anybody ever seen this before? Anybody? One, two, okay, oh, good. A couple people from the old days, maybe. And we got together every week and we started talking about our practice and about what we were doing and how we felt about it and slowly and surely, through the process of those conversations, I started to learn. I don't know why I learned, there was no curriculum set, but coming together as professionals, coming together and sharing our experience somehow did something valuable. The problem with that is communities are a lot of work. If you try to organize a community, you try to maintain a community, it takes a lot of time. And it's very difficult to use a community to solve a problem because communities are full of people. People do whatever they want. So in 2008, I was fortunate enough on Ed Tech Talk to interview Stephen Downs and George Siemens the summer that they realized they had something weird going on. So that summer, the summer of the first MOOC, uh, I think by the time I interviewed them, they had about 1,300 registrants. 
which for that time was a ton of people to have in an online space. And we started talking about it, and I said, you know, it kind of sounds like you've got a massive open online course. And somebody wrote it down, and three years later, it showed up in the New York Times. Had I known at the time, I would have come up with a better name, and I apologize to all of you. <laughs> I have been taunted for this name for many years, um, but it's not my fault. But in the process of that course, we started to realize that there was some potential using the internet as platform, some potential to bring people together, particularly professional people, and I'm mostly going to talk about professional training when I get to the RISO 15 part of this, but when you think of the internet as a place where people come together, there's a lot of real cool learning we can do. But when I look at that, think about that whole context of learning, and it draws back here for a second, and set up the context, the journey, I guess, that I've been on for the last 10 or 15 years trying to figure this stuff out. So we're going to go a short history, a very short, very abbreviated history of learning. Four stories. So we start out as humans, the most important connection that we have is that one-to-one -one connection between people. We look at Julius Caesar, 62 BC. We've got one of the most brilliant people of all time and also one of the cruelest people who ever lived, but an absolute political genius. And in 62 BC, he decided he needed to be a better speaker. He decided that he needed to learn how to be better at standing up in front of people and convincing them how to do things. And let's face it, that was the absolute core of his career. Whether he was in front of a bunch of soldiers or whether he was in the forum or at the Senate, that man could talk the birds out of the trees. And one of the ways he learned to do it was to go to the island of Rhodes to see one guy. His name was Molin. He lived on an island there, and he was a teacher of rhetoric. Cicero went to the same guy. It takes two weeks. This is a, a really great project from Stanford that shows you how much time and how much it costs to get from one island to another 2,000 years ago. <laughs> so right about, right about there, Caesar was captured by pirates. Because at that time, if you wanted to learn, the risk, apparently, was that you were going to be captured by pirates. Now, the education here, now, to, to be fair, just to close that story, he got freed from the pirates, went back later, killed all the pirates. Nasty guy, Caesar. But the point is that the one-to-one -one relationship that he was looking for was incredibly difficult to get to. It was incredibly expensive to get there and dangerous to get there. But that mentorship relationship is, in my mind, the highest end of what we can do in learning. Whenever we get that chance to be one-on-one -on -one or one-to-two or one-to-five, I was talking to somebody today about engineering programs in India, and he was saying that, you know, we've got really good engineering programs, and I asked what the relationship was, and he says, you know, one-to-ten, one-to-twelve, one-to-fifteen. You can do an awful lot when a teacher is connecting directly to a student, right? But it doesn't scale very well. So one of the ways that we decided to scale was to print stuff. And we're going to fly ahead about 1,700 years here to the University of Toulouse, where they were invited to scrutinize the bosom of nature. In uh, the 13th century at Paris, Aristotle's physics was banned because it was too dangerous, because it talked about, I don't know, physics. So there was an ad campaign that came from the University of Toulouse. Those who wish to scrutinize the bosom of nature to the inmost can hear the books of Aristotle, which were forbidden at Paris. There's two parts of that quote that I'd like you to notice. One of them is the word hear. Okay? When you're looking at it, when you're at the University of Toulouse, you leave from Paris, you go all the way to Toulouse, and you spend your time sitting in the crowd listening to somebody read out the probably one of two copies of Aristotle they have. Right? So all of a sudden, we leave that mentorship relationship. We start to scale it, which is good. But we lose some of that contact. We lose some of that interrogation. So Socrates told us that he hated the idea of writing because it killed the argument. The argument was dead. There was no longer any interaction. So yes, text, writing it down, does give us that scale. It still allows us to hear from the expert, 
but it doesn't allow us to interact with them anymore. So we go from having a mentor to having an expert as a step away from that connection of humans coming together. Step forward another 800 years, that's not right, 600, no, 300 years, sorry, printing press. Step forward about 300 years. Does anybody know Pestalozzi? Do you guys know this guy? I'm hoping in Europe there'll be more Pestalozzi fans. Ah, good, some head nods. When I talk about this in North America, nobody knows who I'm talking about. I mean, Pestalozzi is my educational hero. Some of the stuff that he wrote about building schools in the late 18th century, early 19th century, absolutely beautiful. Some of the things he tried were incredible. Some of the things he failed at were really cool. But one of the most incredible things he tried to do was that he wanted to be able to teach the entire country of Switzerland how to read. Like, just think about the challenges involved in trying to teach a country, a mountainous country, how to read when you have, I don't know, a hundred teachers lying around. And think of the scale, not only in terms of text, but in terms of skill that you need to scale out. And the book that he wrote about this was called How Gertrude Teaches Her Children. And in it, he talks about creating a way of teaching so that somebody can just walk into a room with a student, start at the front of a book, and just flip the book over, follow along through, and the pedagogy gets integrated with the text. So you've taken another step back, and this is what he said. I assert definitely that a school book is only, ah, Crash on me. Oh, yay. I assert definitely that a school book is only good when an uninstructed schoolmaster can use it at need almost as well as an instructed or talented one. So we're talking about the textbook. So we've removed back, that's a really heavy textbook. Can you imagine three kilograms? So now we've stepped back again. We've removed back from that mentor relationship, from the expert, all the way back to content. All of a sudden what we've got is a textbook. We've got a robotic process where somebody starts at the beginning and they flip pages and the pedagogy is intertwined with the expertise. Again, technological advancement really increased the scale. And in Pestalozzi's sense, fantastic, right? The ability to be able to give basic literacy to an entire country. But we've moved past that. And now all of a sudden, we have digital access. And the question becomes, where do we transition as the technology moves? And this is where I always think, when I look at the possibilities of moves, all of a sudden, we're not restricted by the technology of print anymore. So the argument that I'm going to make today is that now what we're talking about is the curriculum becoming people. This is a data map from RISO 15, from the course that I'm teaching still. Anybody from RISO 15 here? I know there's a couple. There's Whitney, hi. Um, that now we can reach out to those people directly again. Those people aren't all necessarily experts. They're not all necessarily mentors. But now we can connect to them directly. And we don't have to have the remove of the expert or the remove of the content. So at this point, usually I get a little bit of resistance and people say, but Dave, you know what? We're really, a course has content. That's what the word means it's inside the course. We teach content, that's the process. So I wanna trouble that word a little before we actually start to talk about the rhizome. When we look at education, what we have is a myth that we've inherited of what education is. We have a belief in what it is, we've gone through it. The now disproved, but I think still useful, Harvard Business School would say that 10,000 hours is what makes an expert. Well, not quite expert, but when you think about it, each of us spent at least 10,000 hours inside of a school before we ever graduated high school. We've all been programmed to see education in a very specific way, where we're supposed to sit down and we're supposed to achieve certain things, and we're supposed to prove to people that we have achieved those things. And that is what we believe education to be. When we dig down to the roots of that, and there's lots of places you can look, this is from a report from uh, my American colleagues in 1876 talking about mandatory education in England. 
I know, MOOCs, 1876, we're moving forward, we'll get there. <laughs> this is what was required to get out of the school in Birmingham, England in 1870. So if you could read a few lines of poetry or prose at the choice of the inspector, there's actually an inspector who went around to check that you could do these things, um, slowly, uh, read a slowly dictated sentence and do compound arithmetic. So if you could do those things, you could get out of the school. So our schooling system, I mean, our, mine in Canada is still very much based on this idea of there being outcomes that you need to prove, and when you prove them, you can get out. It's a process by which you are assessed and then you escape, like a prison. <laughs> So it was built to do a very specific thing. They had a very specific thing in mind. They had a bunch of people who needed to power the factories. And they wanted people to have the come in on time skills, the basic literacies that they needed to perform inside of the factories. This one's actually from the States. But they needed kids, so when you graduated, often 10, 11, 12 years old, once you passed your inspection, you got to leave and come into the factories. So the process of learning was about finishing. Once you get done, then you can go out and actually work for a living. And in this case, in some pretty nasty factories. But the point here is that it was not a lifelong learning process. It was not for the love of learning. It was a proving ground where once succeeded, once it was done, you were expected to never return to that place again. And I would argue that our system is still designed in a lot of cases to do that. Because we have this idea that content is something we pluck off the tree. It's built into the Western culture, right? Knowledge is something that comes from the tree in little packages, and there are truths and not truths. So what I'm going to talk about, and the, the, the core of rhizomatic learning, is a rejection of that tree-based metaphor, a rejection of things being simple and things being packaged and delivered, and rather something that's a lot more complex and a lot messier. So, learning like weeds. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody? I hope not. It is the nastiest weed I have ever heard of. I had it in my garden many years ago. It's called Japanese knotweed. Now, oh, there's a the head nod. <laughs> well, have you had it in your garden? It's terrible, isn't it? It's awful, yeah, I know. When they found it in 2012 during the Olympics, they had to dig down at the site they were gonna build on, they had to dig down 30 feet and 30 feet around it just to make sure it was gone. It, is, it will resist poison, it, does, it will not respond to you. They're aggressive and they're resilient. They are rhizomes, they grow off in different directions, they pop up in different ways, they're difficult to contain, and they follow their own paths. When you think of that against the idea of the tree, you've got a much more flexible, a much more uncertain basis for the learning process. This is from one of my students this year. The rhizome does not begin from nothing. It already exists, and one enters into the middle of things. When you look at the students coming to the classroom, they don't come in the same. They don't come in blank slates waiting to be filled. They all come in from different perspectives and have all this other sort of learning that you can connect to as an educator. <clears throat> Because really what we're looking to do is prepare them for the messy end of success. When I talk about learning, measurement, those kinds of things, and I ask people, you know, how good of a parent are you? Give me a percentage. What evidence would you use to measure your effectiveness in this regard? When I think of my own way of, oh, I was talking today with somebody about, oh, what was it? Oh, I forget. Uh, with somebody else, we're using the same kind of examples. When we actually hit our professional lives, the answers to the questions we have are always journeys that we're on. They're never yes or no problems. They're never ways that end up with simple solutions. So success actually looks like that messy, squiggly little line. So, RISO 14. RISO 15, sorry, I taught it last year too. So, just to give you a sense of the MOOC that I teach, it's six weeks long. April 14th to May 27th, still going on. When the course starts, there's no content. It's a totally empty curriculum. So the idea is that the participants in the course 
actually create the course as it goes along. So if we look at the internet, and this is about situating ourselves in the internet as place. So all of the answers or any, all of the conversations that you could have, any of the content that you could need, already exists out there on the internet. Oh, I know what it was. We were talking about Java programming. So if you look at a Java course that you want to teach, when somebody actually programs in Java, how many people are coders here? How many people of those people generally steal code instead of write it from scratch? Oh, come on, lift your hand. I saw that. <laughs> exactly. The process of learning to code and the process of developing code is mostly a process of discovery and adaptation. And yet, when we talk about teaching those classes, we start from scratch, piece by piece, step by step. Even though the actual high end, the, what you're going to do in the way that I learned HTML and the way that most people did, um, Dr. Kluse and I were talking about this today, is by going, hitting control U on a website, looking at the code there and going, oh, that's how that's done. And then taking that and adapting it. So the content already exists. It's already out there. So we start this course empty with no content. I produce weekly challenges, which hopefully I will show you a number of them here today. They are, which, if there is such a thing, they're what you might think of as the challenges of rhizomatic learning. So if you see a couple of them, hopefully some of them will be useful to you. And those challenges are meant to spark discussion. I send one email in the middle of the week. I don't give anybody any directions. I don't tell them what to do. I don't tell them how to do it. There's no LMS. I don't use any platform to work from. I use the internet as the platform. Um, no offense to the platform vendors who are here today. But conceptually, when I look at it, the internet already has the connections that I need. And when I finish the course, what I'm hoping is that the thing that creates itself, because I have very little to do with creating it, continues on past there. Uh, when we first started doing MOOCs in, the, in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, I ended up hosting the platforms, and then for those of you who've done that before, you realize that I inherited them, and I still try to keep them running years and years later. Or you turn them off, and all the work that everybody did goes away. Whereas if you think of the internet as platform, and people are responsible for their own space, when the course ends, everything just continues. So last year when we ran this, I taught a six-week course. At the end of the course, the students took over and taught six more weeks and I had nothing to do with it. I just stepped back and it just kept going. Now, I don't expect that to happen every year, so particularly engaged group, but the possibility is there, and those people are still working together, even though they hadn't met before. And I think of that as a real positive outcome. The one thing I do do, established this over dinner last night, somebody was asking me about this, is I do social interventions. So where people start to collaborate and that group is international, it is often the case that people see things in very, very different ways. So often there will be conflicts that are based on pedagogy, some of those conflicts are based on epistemology, and some of them are based on ontology. Sometimes people from different cultures just don't see things the same way. And it takes somebody to jump in and go, oh, hold on a second, is it gonna be okay? Let's just work our way through this. Or like last night when, pardon my language, Somebody said, rhizomatic learning is total bullshit, and wrote an entire article about it. I can jump in early and say, wow, there's some really good points there, and acknowledge those points and set the tone of the response, rather than create a situation where some antagonism actually comes out. So most of what I do as a facilitator for the course is I do social interventions rather than content interventions. When somebody writes something, I don't tell them if it's right or wrong. I will guide the rest of the community to that discussion, and most of that communication happens through Twitter. I asked the community to describe what the course was like, and this is what they sent me. Um, not terribly useful, uh, though if you are interested, those links are live, so you're more than welcome to grab this afterwards. I'll post it. And it has a link to a bunch of the projects they were particularly happy with. One of them ended up being a radio play that was built on the fly in week two. Somebody wrote um, a narrative response to something, and then 15 people from different parts of the world got together and threw it together as a radio play. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on there. Anyway, so 
When I say potentially massive, the thing about a MOOC, when you're not working on a platform, you're not in the, in the environments of something like edX, uh, we don't get the kind of numbers that a lot of you people are accustomed to. So the first MOOC in 2008 was 2,400 people. The average, I would say, of the MOOCs we did after that was about 1,000. This is, these are the numbers so far from the course. I've got about probably five or 600 people who are actually participating. When you look through it, I've got about 21,000 tweets from those folks. So the engagement level for that number of people is fairly high. And there's a bunch of engagement that happens at a number of levels. So those blogs are the ones that I've been able to find, and they're the ones that are actually newly created material. So when you look at it, we've probably written about three textbooks during the process of the course. Most of those people are faculty at different universities around the world. And I say special thanks here to Aras and Lelandler. Um, the students, the participants in the course do most of the curation. So I have one student who started doing the curation for all the blog posts. I have another student who did all the curation for, um, for all the statistics, who did all those graphs that I was showing you earlier. Um, we end up with about four and a half comments per blog post. Those are pretty consistent. One of the fun things about RISO is that the participation in the course tends to increase as it goes along. Um, we had a problem here in week four. I made a mistake right there. I asked the wrong kind of question week four, and the participation tanked on me. I think it's going to come back. This is only half the week, so I think it's going to come back up. But the ways in which the facilitation gets done is pretty subtle. And when you miss it, you miss it. And it just goes down the other end. It's interesting in that way. OK, so I'm going to stop there for a second. We've all been sort of sitting here for about an hour. I'm going to take questions in the middle of this, and then I'm going to return back. Because there's some people shaking their heads, and I got some people pointing. I'd like to give people a chance to ask some of those questions, if they will. Go ahead. I'll re for those of you recording, I'll repeat the questions back to get them on the, on the video. So uh, did you just say that most of the participants are experiencing education and are experiencing education? There's no doubt about it. Yeah, mo most of the students, I'll repeat it back. Yes, most of the people who are participating are experienced educators. Have you tried something that makes you not experienced educators? Uh, sure have. Um, <laughs> it can work out. It depends on the scenario and how it's set up. So. Um, it's going to be a lot tougher if the people who are participating don't have the adjacent literacies. So if you have a group of students who are from high schools that have very strong uh, literacy level, like digital literacy levels, it can work out really well. So if you look at a project called youthvoices.com, uh, we've been working with that project for about nine years now. It started about nine years ago. It's a collaborative blogging platform that essentially takes this kind of approach. And it works pretty well, but they're pretty supported by their, by their teachers there. And it takes a while for any given school to get to the point where their literacies are strong enough. I'd certainly say that it works better now than it did nine years ago, because now it's not, um, it's not as strange to have teachers who have the, the ability to be able to do it. I think the corollary to that is the longer we end up working on it and the longer somebody works in the platform, the more you lose, particularly with younger students, at first, they're really shy about their work, and they work harder. But once they get accustomed to being working in the open, it starts to slide back down again. I think, inevitably, if uh, what kind of skills, the question is, is what kind of skills do you expect for students in a course like this? Um, when I announce the course, I send out a list of the things people should probably be able to do. It also describes how they can do those things, because frankly, in this day and age, and I've seen it happen any number of times, if people are interested enough and want to apply themselves, they can actually pick up the skills pretty quickly, as long as they have the adjacent literacy. So you're talking about a 35-year-old who's been working for a living for 15 years, absolutely no problem for them to pick it up. If you have a privileged 18-year-old who has just hit high school and has never worked a day in their life, tougher, a lot tougher. <clears throat> So most of those skills are the ability to collaborate, the ability to engage, um, the ability to uh, respond creatively, right? those kinds of things. I wouldn't say the technological skills are particular impediments in most cases. Obviously, if you don't have 
access to digital connection, if you come from a part of the world that doesn't have internet, those are obviously impediments. Um, but overall, the technology, I think, has gotten to the point where it's easy enough now, where we had one person in the course this year who had never done anything online before. And one of the other participants got them set up on a WordPress account and blogging, and now they've been going on since that point. It's not, I don't think it's a huge impediment anymore. I think it's mostly collaborative skills that are the key. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I didn't use the platform. What was the platform then? Internet. <laughs> so, you mean you need some sort of fora or agora? No. Nope. Meeting places. Don't need meeting places. <laughs> Hashtags. I think it is. So um, the course is designed around, I mean, hashtag Riso15. There's a hashtag inside of Twitter. Uh, there's a Facebook place where people sometimes gather. There, I think there's a Google group. I haven't visited them, but somebody built one and started working there. Um, but the meeting places end up being developed by the students as they start to discover them and as they pass them along. And then I send out those locations through uh, the newsletters. So in those midweek newsletters, I tend to send out updates that tell people where things might be going on. Um, on when it all comes back to the first introduction. So I send out, I don't do a lot of work marketing these courses. I send out one blog post and one tweet that says I'm going to run the course. And then on it with a link to my blog, which has a sign up for the course on it, which essentially just subscribes you to the newsletter. And then from there, I send it out. I think the newsletter piece of this, and for those of you who, who do this, having regular scheduled emails that go out to people is hugely helpful. And it tends to be one of the few places that people go back to. I mean, Stephen Down said this in 2008. And in this particular case, I happen to agree with him. Um, that ends up being the core communication piece. And again, when I look at it and I look through the people inside the newsletter, half of them half of the people who don't open the newsletter are the most active, so it doesn't work for everybody. Now, I assume, I was like, oh, these people, and I look through, and I'm like, those guys are talking all the time. They just don't use, so it doesn't, you're never gonna get anybody through one mechanism, but my hope and the goal of all of this is that when I'm done, there's gonna be a community that can continue. So if I own the platform, then I own the community, and if I leave it, if I turn the platform off, or I get tired of it, or that company closes, or whatever, all those connections are broken. Whereas if I leave them evolve out on the internet, then those connections can sustain themselves long past the course time. I saw a hand flash over there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, as, a, as someone who's in an engineering school, yes? this approach works for highly technical subjects, where you need to have a lot of experience and background. It would depend on what part of it you're trying to do. So for me, um, I do this MOOC on my own in my spare time, and I do it on my own research. So essentially, I'm using, I'm crowdsourcing my research. So I would say that if you're doing a highly technical piece that's new research and you want colleagues from around the world to work with you, I think this would totally work because they're going to contribute their own stuff. I think that if your goal from the engineering program is to produce highly replicable results where each of your students know the same thing, I totally wouldn't use this approach. It wouldn't work at all. It just depends on what your outcomes are. If you want people doing new work, this is a really great approach. If you want people to understand other people's old work and be able to repeat it, not a great approach. Just depends. Anybody else? Maybe one more? Okay. It's an argument against dogmatism? Yeah, sure. I would say. I'm sorry, was that, an, was that a, would you appreciate an argument against dogmatism or are you critiquing an argument against dogmatism? <laughs> oh, okay, good. So um, we'll get down into the topics and we'll see whether or not those tools actually have any sort of usefulness for you guys. So one of the first things you need to do in this process is embrace the uncertainty. If you go into a course without any content, and without clear ideas of what people are going to do, you're going to get some really weird results. Right? Sometimes people are going to say things that upset you. Some things you're going to be, the conversation may go off in a direction that you don't expect. But again, I think that this particular approach resembles the life that we actually lead. So the other one that sort of fits into that massiveness, the, the, where 
the big scale starts to get you into trouble is the independence, because those learners actually have to support their own independent position. They have to actually drive their own learning. Right? If you want them to respond to your questions and you want them to go out and deliver their own content, they need to have that kind of independence. And it's very difficult to force someone to be independent. Right? And so much of our education system is built on that passivity, built on students expecting to be told what to do and being told what success looks like. And in this case, it's not possible to do that. This is from another one of, my, one of the students in the course. I remind myself that nothing is compulsory. Everything is optional. A bit of focus and self-control amongst all the choice. And I should be able to replace anxiety with a calm acceptance of the raging river and manage to keep afloat. So when you're actually working out on the internet inside of that space, whatever that space is, those are the kinds of literacies that students need to learn for all of the work that they're going to do after the course is finished. So hopefully this ends up presenting those literacies in ways that help people out. So when I say radically open, it's open not only in the sense that people are able to see it, but it's open in the sense that people are creating their own content. So one of the first topic of the course this year was learning subjectives. How do you go about learning whenever you don't know what the learning process is going to look like. So when you walk into a new town or you walk into a new job and you're trying to learn what's going on, it's very difficult to figure out exactly what your objectives might be. So then what you end up doing is building strategies that allow you to react to the situation as it goes along. So those learning subjectives were a really big piece of the work that we're doing. The last exercise of the year is going to be trying to interpret those learning subjectives and see how you actually came down. So that's the, that closing piece that actually helps you inform what actually happened throughout the course. The other part of this is assessment. So week two this year was learning as a non-counting noun. So if you imagine that this learning is different for each of the students, there's no way for you to assess whether or not somebody has gotten the right answer because there isn't one, right? It's something that ends up evolving from each student as they go forward, and they end up coming to their own perspectives. So that non-counting noun business ends up being really important for the work that we do. Problem is, is it leads to a lot of confusion. So a lot of people don't know what to expect. This is another one of the designs from. They don't know what to expect, and there's an awful lot of confusion that happens in the middle of this course, and I don't deny it. It's really difficult to process yourself through this. But again, the reason for doing it is that this is what actual learning looks like. It's what learning looks like in our lives. It's what learning looks like in friendships. It's what learning looks like for me as a parent. Uh, it's a confusing process that requires that constant attention. So it's conceptually online. And this is what I was talking about in terms of looking at content or looking at looking past content and back to people, when our students come into our classroom, when we think about that network learning process, right, which is what kind of what we're talking about, those networks are usually set up as these tidy little networks where each one of the dots always connects and everybody knows who's connected to who. But in reality, you know, you have some students who come in with some connections and some understandings. You have other students that come in with other sorts of connections. And the networks of people's understanding start to look like this. So they have different connections and different pieces, and everybody's going to have a very different map of understanding. This is one of the network maps from the course, Twitter interaction from the students that are there. And there's a lot of different experiences that are happening here. So you've got one cluster up here, which is having an entirely separate conversation from some of the other clusters that are here. There are different people who are having totally different experiences. And there are some people, some terribly lonely people, <laughs> who are totally not inside the process at all, who are having a conversation that is separate from the rest of the course. I tried to bring those people in. They weren't interested. They totally will keep, they keep following along with the course, will not interact with anybody else. But that, Experience is an online experience. And this goes back to that earlier chart. Each one of these sections 
is a different kind of conversation that's happening throughout the course. In some cases, they interact, and in some cases, they live out on their own, having separate experiences as part of their relationship to the course. But all these connections are connections that these people are growing. This is what I think of as one of the outcomes to the course, is that level of connectivity. Because the content of the course is the people in the course. It doesn't have to be separated out. They're learning directly from each other's knowledge, from each other's experience, which means that the learning process is actually cheating. When we think of content as separate, then we control the content, we control access to answers, then cheating, and this is, when we look at the statistics on cheating in MOOCs, holy smokes, um, you can get an answer key and dive in. There's no answer key here. Cheating is actually the goal. What we're trying to do is get people to look to each other for those answers, to look to each other to share the experiences that they each have so that they can grow as they move forward. And what I have described to you, and I've had this said to me probably three times already today, probably doesn't sound like a course anymore, right? Course is supposed to have objectives, content, and assessment. And I've just said that I don't have objectives, I don't have content, and there's no assessment. So the question becomes, Dave, why are you calling this a course in the first place? Well, I still think it's important that we're able to do this. And I think that when we look at the courses we have it, it's founded on that idea of content being text, being printed, being put with ink on a tree we cut down, put on the back of a truck and shipped around to people as being something we have to figure out ahead of time. And sometimes when we go to the internet, we forget that the content is already out there, and that the people are out there, and that we can create systems that allow us to structure, that happened again, that allow us to move those people together for a certain period of time. So five years ago, we came up with sort of a simple statement for how that works inside of a course, that the goal of that course is orient yourself to the course, declare yourself as part, as where you're standing, to network yourself with those people, find that cluster on the map I showed you earlier that works for you, and then focus your way forward. I think these are literacies that come out of learning this way that end up serving the students who are in that. And then for me, as an instructor, as a facilitator, I'm planning for my own obsolescence. So ideally, by week six, the students have almost forgotten that I'm there. And the process of teaching ends up being setting up a community like this. In my case, setting up a community of who are all talking about stuff that I'm really interested in, finding other people to learn from, and then being able to step away from that and allowing them to continue their work together. So I'm planning for my own obsolescence as part of that process. So I think that rhizomatic learning builds from those diverse perspectives when you take the content out of the hands of the instructor and you turn it over to the community. I think it develops those practical literacies. It puts you to the point where the things that you're doing in the course are the same things you'd be doing as a professional. That discovery process we were talking about with programming earlier. And I think it allows you to make real connections between real people and have those connections be connections that in some case could last for a professional lifetime. So I think the myth that we inherited where there's a small subset of things that people need to know to escape the school system is one we can replace with an open system that's actually not designed to hold, to, to, it's not a, a system we escape from, but it's one that gives people the literacies they need to grow. Because when I ask what I'm teaching for, what's the purpose of the education process for me? I think that the community is the, is the curriculum that I'm trying to teach. It's both the vehicle, yes, they connect together, but it's actually the goal of the process. A successful student for me is one that can interact inside of a community of knowers, that can be successful inside of that community of knowers. That is part of that community of knowers. So that success is never finishing. Thank you.
So I think we've got a couple of minutes for any more. Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes in honor of Whitney, who was here. If anybody doesn't want to ask a question, Whitney brought me a poster that says that, another design that came from the course this year. Posters down there, it's pretty cool. Yes? Sure, again. I'll actually just show it to you. Oh, is my internet going to work? I just saw it bounce a couple of times, didn't I? So, um, in, let's see, in week three of this year, the title was Content is People. So then, what I asked people to do was imagine what the shift is. So if you actually consider content, if you, if you get rid of the idea of content, what's the impact on the learning that you're doing? The reason for putting it that way is it's argue, obviously argumentative. I mean, content is a, it's a core concept that we have inside of our process. But what I'm trying to do is shift that focus towards the connection to people. So essentially, that was, there's a, it was phrased, I spent a long time phrasing it, I wish I could show it to you because I'm not going to remember it verbatim. But the purpose was to, yeah, so essentially that was it. And there's a short one minute video and that's the whole process. And that led to 5,000 tweets. It's a pretty active crowd. Anybody else? Let's see if I can find that. Yes. Isn't that funny? Couldn't agree with you more. Topic for week five is rhizomatic learning and invasive species. That w that's the topic we're doing right now. I totally agree with you, right? So it's one of those things. Did you set? Did you know that? Or you set me up for that? No, you didn't. Oh, great, funny. Uh, that that's that's exactly what we're doing right now. Because yeah, I mean, when I look at education, to me, we're constantly in a point of dissonance. We're always living with conflicting pieces. So yes, we need assessment at some level to be able to get funding from organizations, but at the same time, if we just do assessment, we're not doing learning. So you end up balancing all the time. And I think of rhizomatic learning as that balance in the invasive, yeah, sometimes it gets too inward focused and you end up with that echo chamber of people who just agree with each other, which for me was happening, which is why I asked that question this week, because I wanted to force that group to think, oh right, maybe we are sort of too far inward looking, maybe we need to start reaching out more. And when I talk about socially intervening, part of what I do is try to snip that in a couple of places to allow it to grow a little bit more. I think I took the biological metaphor too far there, but <laughs> sorry, but I take your point. Yes, I agree entirely. It can certainly go in that direction. Yes? <laughs> Technically speaking, I do. Last year, they totally ignored me um, and went on for another six weeks. This year, it's the 27th of May. But again, um, the last week's topic is going to be so hard that I'm expecting I'll probably get submissions for the four or five weeks after. Um, I don't know. It entirely depends on the, on the community and how they go about it. It may be that something else may come up. They may move on to something else. But for me, it's formally the 27th of May. It's the date that I take my hands off it. Because whenever I run this course, it, I'll wake up to 100 tweets on Twitter to a whole bunch of things. And it takes, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of engagement. So I have to have the end date just for my own sanity. Anybody else? Yes? <laughs> sure. Which course at the MIT Media Lab? The learning creative journal. Oh, oh that's, that's... Oh, that's something. No, no, I, I'm trying to remember the guy's name who did it, because I met with him last year about it. Um, I actually, I talked to those people about that course. So there are certainly some crossovers there. Um, they're not quite as out there. They're a little bit more contained inside the Media Lab. They have to have response. It's one of the reasons why I do this outside, because this is... I, I don't, it doesn't have to respond to anybody's structures. Yeah. 
Uh, so it's a, theirs is a bit more constrained, but it's a really good project. Yeah, for sure. What is that kid's name? Are you talking about Philip? Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. I know it's, it's a really cool project. I, it, learning creative learning at the MIT Media Lab. It's a really cool project, yeah. for sure. I was just wondering if this is something that sort of uh, uh, maybe developed in different places. Oh, absolutely. There are lots of people who are doing really cool work like this. Um, Annette Dalsgaard um, has a really great project uh, out of Denmark right now. She is um, doing her PhD in midwifery. Um, and she has a community of people, uh, midwives, who meet for an online conference every year. There are about 5,000 of them from around the world. So they're running a MOOC right now, actually, uh, MOOCs for Midwives. Um, that is, uh, they have 15, 1,600 people taking a really collaborative approach. Uh, it's a very good project. Um, Christine's projects, uh, her French projects are fantastic. They have some really great interactive collaborative stuff that's going on. Uh, I was talking to the guys from Future Learn. They have some pieces that they're dropping in. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about them. <laughs> uh, I won't say any further. Maybe they'll be talking about them later. Some really great collaborative pieces that they're throwing in that are um, uh, that are very collab that are very cool in that sense. The the guys at, uh, in Spain at U uh, with three C. I never get U three U C three M. Uh, have some really great collaborative people. There's lots of that stuff going on. There's no doubt about it. I certainly didn't mean to claim that I'm the only person. Pierre Dillenborg is here. I didn't cre create collaborative learning. Um, I see he's gone again, that guy. Anybody else? Yeah. We do a really good job of beating it out of them there in primary school, for sure. There are some really fantastic grade one, two, three projects out there. Um, I have some colleagues in the States who do some really interesting ones. Um, most of the people I would work with would be constrained by um, the federal laws around doing that online. So doing open learning with little kids is really, really hard in North America. I don't know enough about the laws here, but as much as I think you could do really awesome work, the legal problems involved would make it really difficult to do so, which is why so many of them are lockdown projects because, you know, there's a really great one, I forget the school, um, where every year they go up back and discover what animal moved in that year, and then they do a collaborative project between them and another school sort of following along, it was ducklings one year or whatever, some really great stuff, where they don't know what's gonna come, they react to what they have, they go out online and find stuff to go with it. They reach out to experts who come in and talk to them about it, and they really take that discovery approach to the learning process. So, so what's, what's the trick then to sort of, if you have to respond to your study structures, right? Mm -hmm. So I teach a course, a face-to-face, at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, as I would claim that learning isn't something that can actually be measured, um, I'm not too troubled about the fact that I can't for the course. So what I tend to do for that course is I use a learning contract. So there's some really great work done in the 70s and 80s around learning contracts. So I use a learning contract, and then I get the students to commit to the work. So a student in my class will pick an 85. That is their final grade. And then commit to what it's going to be to get there. And then upon completion, satisfactory completion of those assignments, whatever they decide they want to do, then I'll measure that, or measure it. I'll count them up, and as long as those are satisfactory completions, essentially it's like having 15 pass-fails inside of a course. And that allows me to get around the requirements for going through with it and allows me to still provide a different experience for each student in the course of the process. But I mean, Malcolm Knowles was saying that in 1970. It's just he didn't have the internet. It makes it an awful lot easier with the internet. There are Malcolm Knowles quotes. That's always good. Anybody else? One last question, maybe? Or are we all done? Thanks so much for your patience and attention, everybody. <laughs>